Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 3.30 R9 Tech Bits session. Um, today, we are going to be learning more about code illusion. And our presenter is Julie Crawford. She is the lead K-12 education specialist of Life is Tech USA. Uh, they're, they're the creators of the renowned K-12 coding education curriculum, most notably their um, collaboration programs uh, with Disney and um, for with Disney Code Illusion. So we're excited to have her. She is uh, the lead strategist for New Mexico. And she works with the state and district specific education leaders to create custom coding education pathways and implementation plans for grades K through 12. Um, on before her life before uh, <laughs> joining Life as Tech, uh, she was a foreign language teacher for 12 years in public and private school systems. And she specializes in Latin. Wow. Um, across the grades six through 12, and she holds four degrees, y'all. So uh, we're, we're lucky to have her here today, and uh, she's also awesome fun to be around. So I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Julie, it's yours. Thanks so much, April. Hey, guys. So um, as April said, I'm Julie Crawford. I'm uh, really excited to talk to y'all. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Um, want you guys to get the most out of this as well. Um, if you want to throw something in the chat, I've got some of my colleagues that are here um, who would be happy to moderate and um, I'll probably tag them in at some point uh, when they're least expecting it to, uh, to help me out today. So um, we provide coding platforms and an entire curriculum pathway for uh, K through 12 students. It's so fun to do. Um, as, you can, as you can imagine with my language background, um, Acquisition is really important and the pedagogy behind that is really important to me. So um, with that in mind, I uh, wanted to talk to you all about project based learning or problem based learning today and how that is an effective approach for learning coding languages um, and why it's important to start text based languages at an early age. Um, so I'll just jump in. All right. Sorry, I have to. I could talk all day. It's the manipulation of all the things Zoom. Um, so before we get started, um, you know, what we hear from our customers, and we're very much a customer first um, organization, um, we always hear engagement. And as teachers, we know that engagement is a top priority of students of all age, right? Like try, I know for seniors here, it's their last day today. Try keeping them engaged on their last day of school, right? Like you have to have something that draws their attention. Um, and right now, there's a lot of platforms that aren't necessarily doing that. Um, we always like to start out talking to our customers, um, finding out what they're doing, um, because we don't want to take over. We want to work with you and be a partner in coding education. So we generally start out by asking, what type of coding program are you using? If you have one at all, there's still a lot of districts that don't have one implemented. We also talk about um, what kind of coding languages are being introduced. What we have seen, and this is crazy, y'all, think about this. You take Latin one, right? You'll take Latin one repeatedly for a couple years, and then all of a sudden you go into AP Latin. Like, I don't know about you, that would, I mean, as a Latin teacher, that would terrify me still. That's a huge jump. Um, so think about our students who are going through school and elementary and middle school only learning block-based coding. And then all of a sudden in high school, they're like, oh yeah, I'll add AP computer science. That teacher's cool. This will be useful. And they've never seen text-based languages before. And it's all based on that. So that's a really jarring example and why we need to introduce this to students. We also need to tell them why it's relevant. Um, and why they might need it and apply it in the real world. Um, we also I'll also like to see if the whole school is using the program or is it present in the district? What, what does that look like? Um, is there a vision in mind? It's, it's always fun to talk to uh, districts where they're like, yeah, we had a meeting like a year and a half ago. We're gonna try this out. Not sure if it's gonna work, but we're gonna have a second iteration, um, but this is our end goal. Um, so what I'll usually do for customers is I'll put together a year by year plan to show how it's all going to break out and to get to your end game. Um, and I, I think that's super fun. 
my husband just shut the door on me. Um, the last thing we talk about is what challenges are you facing? Everybody has different challenges that they have, whether it's um, teachers not being certified, right? Um, teachers never having seen computer science before in their life, not having teachers, right? I mean, there's, I'm, I'm part of the problem. I burned out last year and here I am. Um, you know, it, we have so many different challenges that we're facing students that aren't interested in it. Um, not enough time in the day. Um, you know, no prep time. I, there's so you guys know. So what are you facing? How can we help you with that? Um, and so those are all things that we try to discuss. Um, where are we coming from? Our company started in Japan. Um, in 2010, and we came over to the States about three years ago, uh, we have, we're the number one coding education provider in Japan, and it's not just platform um, and software, it's also going to be um, after school activities, it's going to be, um, you know, virtual classes, it's going to be summer programs, we are doing everything. Um, one of the reasons why we're so successful, and think about how, you know, how many, you um, coding products come out of Japan, right? One of the reasons we're so successful is because we are created by industry leaders for future industry leaders. So we are really trying to show students how they can use this knowledge in the real world. But it's not just like, a, you know, oh, well, you could be a software engineer using that, right? It's showing them different veins that they may not have even thought about because we're looking at not only web design, but also game development, which is so relevant for kids, um, as well as media art. Uh, we also have programming for many other areas as well. So trying to keep it as uh, career ready for them as possible. Uh, one thing I wanna touch on with this as well is, um, you know, our whole mission for our company is to nurture and maximize each learner's unique potential for lifelong success in and out of the industry. And what that means for us is creating equity within coding education. You should not, you should not, not, sorry for the double negative, have access to this type of programming and this type of education. Um, and because you're not in, you know, the big city that gets all the money from the state, you, that's, that's not okay right? Like everybody needs to be able to have access to this and have an equal chance to use it. They also need to know why they need to use it. I work with a lot of schools in Alabama who are very rural. Um, and they're like, well, we're trying to bring this here so that they know because they want to get out of the town or they want to be able to contribute and modernize a little bit. Um, and this is how we need to do it. Um, so it's really exciting to see how those students are growing and applying their new, newly learned skills. Um, what we have seen in the market thus far for coding education has been very extreme. Uh, we have on the one hand block-based coding, which I mean, I, you have it on Osmo, you have it Fisher Price has come out with this, this type of uh, coding now, right? Um, in the classroom, however, you've probably seen some of these names, code.org, Scratch, et cetera. Um, and that's fantastic. It's a great way to get started. However, it's a huge jump to get to what you see on the right. Those are blocks. It's very dictated for you, right? Like you cannot manipulate it more than what it's, it's allowing you to. So students who have this creative aspect and want to be able to do more can't. Um, that's discouraging for a kid, especially if that's something that they're looking forward to and wanting to do. Um, so on the other hand, we have this text based it's direct instruction. And what I mean by that is it's purely traditional um, where you watch a video on a concept like make a circle, the kid practices how to make a circle, just how to make a circle, that's it, okay? Can, can we make it red? Can, can I change the size and make it bigger? Sorry, can you wait till like chapter five for that? It, that's when we address it. That could be five weeks from that point in time. That is super discouraging for that kid, right? Because they are stuck just making a circle for one week, next skill the next, their question is still unanswered. But it's also really discouraging for the teacher. I hated when I didn't know an answer to a question for a kid and I couldn't find it immediately on Google, right? Like where's Wikipedia accuracy when I need it at that point? But for the teacher, like 
what's going to happen, right? They're going to spend their planning period looking that information up, maybe trying to make a lesson around that um, because they don't have any access to it or the time that they should be spending with their family or just like, oh, I don't know, relaxing for a second. They're spending all of that time trying to answer the child's question. That's discouraging for the teacher as well. So it's kind of this, uh, this cycle that... It, it, it really destroys the um, want and the need for students um, and for teachers with that type of curriculum. So here we are sitting in the middle. Um, and the reason why we're in the middle is because we are the why behind the block-based pudding, right? So we are introducing text-based to students. However, it's in a gamified and very highly motivating and engaging manner. Um, and so with this, students will move along at their own Pace, which I think is fantastic. Um, the reason they're able to do that is because we use PBL. I'm going to use a lot of acronyms today, as I'm sure you all are familiar with in education. There, there is a slew of them. Um, so today we're going to talk about PBL, which can be project-based learning or problem-based learning. In other words, you're going to be learning by doing. So you're exploring real world challenges. In our case, we're exploring an actual programming module and we're going to be um, learning skills along the way in order to get an outcome, right? So it's kind of that backwards design idea um, and it's in a controlled environment. So the kids are not gonna break it because again, that can be really discouraging. So I like to always call it, it's a controlled sandbox. Um, so you can see in the picture here even, this is where you're going to be writing the code, right? And you have prompts here as well. So you have a lot of control over it and the repetition is going to help with that retention for students. All right, any questions so far? Nope, sorry, that's my big daughter walking around now. All right, ah, here we go. So what makes a good PBL experience for teachers and for students. Um, there's eight main criteria. I'm not going to touch on all of them because you all can read and probably understand what some of these are since you're in educational um, surroundings. I do want to point out, however, that some key elements are going to be having a challenging problem, create a scenario where they need to find the solution. This is going to create IBL is inquiry-based learning. Students have to ask questions in order to get to the answer. So again, is that backwards design where they are going, they know what they, where they need to get to, how am I going to get there? What skills and knowledge am I going to have to acquire in order to meet my user's experience, right? And, and make it so that it is as robust as possible for them. Um, so you're going to have to have all of these um, various skills and the teacher is there to moderate it. So now what you're creating is a social emotional learning classroom as well, right? Sorry, another acronym, SEL. So the teacher gets to take a step back and they are moderating. So rather than being up at the front and dictating what students, you know, repeat after me, do this. This is like me trying to force a noun chart down students' throats and they're going, so I need to memorize this for the quiz tomorrow my blood pressure would raise any time a child would say that, right? No, you're, you're not memorizing, you are learning because you will use this later, right? And that's what this is about is they need to practice it. They need to hone their skills so they can use it later on. And it's a go-to for them. It's kind of like when, um, you know, you're in, in school and your friend asks you to help, help out with this math problem, but you're like, I, I don't know, I had trouble with it too. But you start talking it out and it makes sense to you, right? It's a learn by teaching. That's what it is, right? Like the kids are teaching themselves. They're teaching each other. So it's this group effort and they're learning all these soft skills, collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, skills that are going to really serve them well in life. Um, so this is putting students at the center of education, which is why we're there, right? So this is really important and a big aspect of um, what we're doing in Disney Code Illusion and all of our curriculum. So we briefly touched on this. Um, when you are taking the traditional approach where, you know, teacher is up front and lecturing, if you will, I always hated it when they called it that because there's always a, a time and a place for that, right? Um, so with that, 
like I said, time and place, but project-based learning is going to create that unique experience for students where it's hard for them to forget, right? Because they are applying a specific set of skills to an environment um, for them to solve it, right? And they have to understand it in order to get to that, that end game. Um, examples of PBL, you can read here. Um, my real world example that's going on like right now in my life is both my daughters, I've got one in uh, pre-K and one in second grade. They were both studying the life cycles of plants simultaneously, it, obviously at different like levels. Um, both daughters had planted a seed of some sort at school. Historically, and my husband was making fun of me about this today, historically, everything that comes into this house that's a plant, I have killed like within a week we decided that we were going to try planting seeds, right? And then grow them. And they've got these cool little like greenhouse effect thingies that help water. They says it's self-watering. This is why I got it because I'll forget. Um, we have seedlings growing now and I'm very proud of myself. My kids even looked at me yesterday and go, I'm so proud of you, mom. That hurts a little, I'm not gonna lie. But they were able to tell me as we're planting and as it's growing, why it's doing that at different levels, obviously. And of course, like teacher and me is, you know, prodding them along with it, but they are doing it, right? Like this is their project that they are working on. Our outcome is to make a garden in the backyard that I will eventually just have to take care of because they won't. But this is what's happening at my house, real life, right? And they were doing it at school. We killed one of the plants that came back home with them. So we, you know, recreated. In coding, however, think about this. Think about, um, you know, you're asking the kids to support a cause, right? And show how you can gain support for this cause and what's, you know, what's the issue at hand, who supports it, um, you know, what, what does a timeline look like, things of that nature. We, we, you and I probably made poster boards with this information on it, right? Or had to write a paper. Um, and I was very into making my, my posters. It was, it took me a while, perfectionist over here they can make a web page now. Like with the skills that they learn in the first four chapters of Disney Code Illusion, they can make a website where they are explaining everything and have links to things um, that go into detail on this scenario or on this cause, right? They can create a portfolio of their work. And it's not just their coding work. They can create a portfolio that has um, samples of their writing right? Or samples of their artwork that they've used, that they've created. They have so many opportunities here um, to express themselves. And then guess what? When they apply to college, when they apply to anything, a summer internship, they have this in their repertoire, which is fantastic. Cause I don't know about you, like even to this day, I don't write down things that I've accomplished. So like, if I ever need to update my resume, I'm like, cool. What did I do? I have no idea no idea. I mean, I got an award at some point in time in my teaching career, right? I couldn't tell you what year it was at all, unless I looked at it. I mean, if I kept the certificate or something, right? So, you know, this, this keeps it all in one place for them. There we go. So the benefits of why, and I know we've already talked about a lot of these, the benefits of having PBL, again, um, you're going to have that engagement factor that we're all striving for with students, um, which is going to mean that the students are going to perform better. They're engaged in it, uh, it's repetitive. You're going to have that retention, which means they will perform better. Um, you have that SEL because they improve teacher-student interaction. That's huge, especially after COVID when every, I mean, these kids were so isolated during COVID, right? Like, my daughter didn't even know how to talk on the phone with her friend. She would just hang up the phone. There was no buy. They were mid-conversation. She was just done. She hung up the phone. What? Are you kidding? No, that's not how we do things. That's how she thought she did it because of Zoom. That you just like everyone goes, ah, which is true, right? So we had to teach her how to like end a conversation. We have that that opportunity to interact be encouraging be their role model right because now we're in that, that we're going to be in that role as a teacher of going man that's awesome how, how did you do that can you show me how you did that oh i have a teacher who believes in me and wants me to and is like showing me this and is excited for me you know 
you know, they think we sleep under our desk in the classroom, right? And like, that's all we do is to be there to torture them and have our red pens handy. So this is a new side that we can show them that we're, you know, people, which is fantastic. Um, let's see here. We've talked about all the rest of those. Look at that. All right. So again, pitfalls, we talked about the, um, you know, the benefits of having PBL in your classroom. Some of the pitfalls that we've talked about throughout it's discouraging, not only for students, but also for teachers. That is the last thing we need. I just heard about another teacher I worked with two years ago. He is quitting teaching. He's a fantastic teacher and he's young, like early twenties. And he's quitting teaching to go work for a software company because he was just done. And I asked, I asked my friend today, I was like, why, why, you know, like, I know why I left, but why was this year so bad? Like we weren't as impacted by COVID and virtual days. Like what, what was it? And they were like, you know, like that stress and those factors have never gone away. Even though a lot of the restrictions are lifted, they still, there's still so much expected of us and to wear so many hats. And it's not like we're getting anything more for it even appreciation, right? So it's discouraging um, when you're not having an engaged class because you go home like white at that point, right? You're emotionally drained because the kids weren't giving you anything. It's like signing on a Zoom and it's all black, you know, because no one has their camera turned on. Thanks guys. So it's, it's the same idea where you have that interaction, right? It's limiting because the students can only learn as much as you're giving them. And you don't want to just give them a little. There's always going to be that kid who wants more and you want to be able to provide that. Um, it's also going to be boring if they're not engaged. It's not just boring for them. It's boring for you as a teacher as well, right? Like I love those impromptu discussions that we would have because the kid had a weird cur curiosity. Great. Like, let me put my master's to work and tell you what I know about this, right? Like I spent a lot of time in school to learn this stuff so I could give it to you. So let's do that. Let's have this cool conversation. So with Disney Code Illusion, which is our flagship program, we have two different levels of it. We've got basic as well as advanced. All of these are going, and all of our curriculum is going to be learned by doing, all right? Um, it is controlled, but it's learned by doing and you work at your own pace. And we are able to do this, you can see my little, cat-ish friend. And I say that because I always get corrected. She's not actually a cat. Her name's Mimir. She's adorable. Um, she's so nice. So we introduce coding and by we, I mean Mimir introduces coding to students through three different lenses. And this is where the career readiness comes in. So students are going to be able to see text-based languages. And we actually introduce four within our basic program. They're going to learn JavaScript, processing, HTML, and CSS. And those will be applied to media art, game development and design, as well as web design. You are going to be using 14 original Disney movie scenes. So that's where the benefit of Disney comes in, right? So we, we are going to be actually getting in there and manipulating these scenes that we have only seen from a distance thus far. I'm sorry, but there is no one that can't relate to a Disney movie because we've all grown up with them. It's familiar and it's comforting. The scariest thing with foreign languages is that you feel vulnerable and you immediately have this like pushback because you're like, ah, I don't know it. I'm so sorry. I don't know it. I don't want to do it. No, you're familiar with Disney. You know this stuff, right? And Mimir is going to hold your hand and help you through that. So it's a familiar uh, template that you're going to be working with. When we get to advanced, you're then going to be adding a different and deeper level to every single focus area, as well as the student is going to be let go a little bit and write 10 times the amount of code they did in the first program. So they are going to learn a fifth language and for media art, which is Shader GLSL. You add the design aspect into game development. So talking about those soft skills, right? With critical thinking, problem solving, et cetera. That's creativity shines at that point. And then with web design, you're going to be utilizing JavaScript to get new features involved with your web design aspect. Do I have any questions thus far? All right, cool. Sorry, I get on a roll sometimes, y'all. Ah. 
So what we offer as a full K-12, because I can't sit here and tell you we have a full K-12 curriculum offering and only talk to you about one program. That's silly. However, Disney Code Illusion is over 120 hours of curriculum when you're talking about an elementary school classroom. And this is the beginning jumping off point. So this says that it's grades two through 12. It can actually go down to grade one because Mamira is going to be narrating. Um, and I'll let Amanda fill you in on some of the, the kind of new things that we're gonna have going on with that as we get into it. Um, but she'll be narrating and you can toggle that offer on. So again, differentiating learning for our students um, and think about it for two chapters of curriculum, that's about 30 hours. Elementary school students are realistically meeting in a specials class to learn this information. And within that specials, it's one time a week for 30 to 45 minutes. I mean, that's, that's just the reality of what we can provide to students at that age. So 30 hours, that gets them through a full school year. I mean, there may be some left over realistically because you have fire drills and you have to take attendance and all the other stuff you have to do. So that's two years. Then in the next uh, next year, you do another two chapters. There are seven chapters total in Disney Code Illusion Basic. That's gonna last you a couple of years. Then you get to Disney Code Illusion Advanced. That's the same thing where you're going to be going bite-sized pieces for each year, all right? So it's, it's really cool how that's set up. We also have all these external portfolio projects that Amanda is going to explain to you um, that we're so proud of and the kids really do so well with them. Um, and it just adds a different layer. Once they're, they've completed Disney Code Illusion Advanced, they then would go on to a language specific programming. Uh, the first one we'll be releasing in the spring is going to be Python and AI. Um, and you wanna talk about PBL, this one's really cool. It's got three phases and the scenario is that you have a bakery, but you need to get customers for this bakery because it's brand new. So you're going to use the foundations of HTML and CSS that you learned in Disney Code Illusion and you're gonna create a web page or a website. Then in the second phase, you've got customers, but you need to create loyalty. So in order to do that, you're going to create feedback features or blogging features using Python. Okay, so the kids have to learn those skills in order to um, in order to complete that. Then in the third and final phase, you have so many customers, you need to expedite the checkout process. So they're going to use AI picture recognition, which I think is really cool. Um, and they're going to expedite that checkout process for them. So they have a real life scenario that they could actually come across, right? Like our kids are so entrepreneurial nowadays. I mean, this is perfect for that. Um, I cannot tell you how much money I would have saved with Weebly and their premium package or whatever if I had known these skills way back when. It would have been fantastic because literally chapter four of Disney Code Illusion, it gave me everything I needed for 15 years. So cool. But we have a lot of those. However, another thing um, that we see a lot of times is, you know, for standards to be met, you need to have that digital citizenship, literacy, cybersecurity, all of those aspects need to be covered as well. So with that in mind, we have our computer science essentials. Um, and this program is going to go through that type of um, thinking and that those skills and th that knowledge base. Um, another thing with the top pathway up there um, is that it's not just computer programming, but we're also going over computational thinking. I know that is a hot topic right now, especially with computer science um, and speaking with CS for all, that is a hot topic um, and, and schools need to cover that. So, you know, this PBL aspect is going to get them to that point. So it's kind of a neat, neat way to um, have that in, included. Right, so I was just checking the chat. All right, let's see here. So one thing that's neat, we've already talked about what grades it's appropriate for. What's going to be different between the grade levels is how fast they go through the program, okay? So what's gonna take a high schooler 60 hours is going to take an elementary school student about 120 hours, okay? Middle school, 90 hours. So you can kind of see where my math went there, right? Double or time and a half with that. Um, so with that in mind, it doesn't mean 
that it's not appropriate for a second grader. That is not appropriate for a senior because it says Disney. All right. We've got also got a huge anime component. And like you saw, like the scene is literally the fabric with which they are, you know, learning and doing. So it's not, you know, it's not all up in your face. Um, but we are URL based. Sorry, that was weird. Um, we are URL based. So you don't have to worry about any upgrades, downloads. So your tech director will be really happy. Um, and we can push everything automatically. And with, thanks, Hannah. Um, and with the uh, integrations with Clever, Classlink, Google, and Google Classroom, your rosters will automatically sync um, and be updated, especially with those pesky drop ads that you always get at random times. Um, but this is going to lead into metrics that you as a teacher can, um, can track. And with this, you can look, you can grade in three different ways. The first, of, first way is standard-based because we are fully aligned with CSTA standards, CSTA standards at the elementary middle and high school levels. So you can grade them based on those because we have all of them and they will be also be connected on your teacher or admin account. You can grade competency-based. Uh, with competency-based, it's a rubric, right? Who doesn't love a good rubric? Um, it's a star system. The kids think that they're earning stars so that they can get extra levels. <laughs> it's their grade. Okay. One star is going to indicate that they finished the level. Two stars means that they answered questions correctly. So proficient, right? So not as proficient. Third star is going to indicate that they did not use any hints. So now we've got mastery of that and they can move on. Um, now for teachers, and this is the exciting part, you don't need any coding experience in order to facilitate because our little friend up there, Mamir, does it for you. She gives all instructions, she gives all hints, and she even pats you on the back verbally. So it's really exciting and it, it takes care of everything for you, which means that the students can move at their own pace. Everybody's going to approach this in different ways. You need to be able to replay it. That's part of competency-based education, right? You replay for retention um, and you do it until you're able to do well on it, right? And then that's when you're able to be assessed on it. So we have this where um, our program is being facilitated in uh, the media center. It's being facilitated in after school clubs. It's being facilitated um, by para pros. Um, it's being facilitated by computer science teachers who never learned HTML and are learning it through our program and are really excited because now they have new skills that they're comfortable with. Um, and guess what? They don't have to lesson plan because it's already done for them. I mean, who doesn't want that? A dream of not having to lesson plan. So it's a really easy situation where it is no extra work for you. You're fully supported by our customer success team and by us, and you let the kids go. Great. Uh, and the, the lessons are also scaffolded. Sorry, I'm just making sure I'm hitting all the high points here. The lessons are scaffolded. Um, and the reason they are, or the way that they are scaffolded is by having formative and summative. And again, this goes right nicely into competency-based. We've got our gem lessons, which you can see our gems over here. Each color is going to represent the focus area that we're dealing with. So yellow gems are going to indicate the basics of the PC. These are all optional. I don't recommend they stay optional. These are going to be skills on a mouse, dragging, dropping, clicking, et cetera. Then you're going to get into the keyboard, right? So typing, we're introducing syntax because it's text-based, right? So with that, you need to spell correctly, right? You need to know how to type on the keyboard. Not only that, you need to know how to capitalize. It's a concept not many students realize they need to do. Punctuation, <laughs> they need to know all that. They have to apply it or else it doesn't work. Um, so we are teaching them those skills and it's not in a demeaning or condescending way. It's in a way where it's challenging them and it's asking them to kind of level up with it. Um, and then they're going to utilize it as soon as they get into the platform. All of the red gems are then going to be our media art lessons. Um, then we get into our blue gems, which are web design and green is going to be game development. Once you have completed the gems, which are skills, so they are going to be one skill built upon the other until you get to the summative. The summative will bring all of those together and it's very easy to see how they all fit together. So it's all the puzzle pieces together. Um, in chapter one, 
you're going to have one summative, right? Because you're, we're trying to keep it very simple. Chapter seven, you could have up to set, you could have up to five summative activities. It's a whole adage. You cannot assess or you should not assess in a way the students haven't practiced, right? It's not fair to the student um, to do that. So we're trying to get them to practice in a way that they would see it in the real world environment. And that leads us to our external projects, which Amanda is going to tell us about. Perfect. Love chatting about the external projects. Um, so in addition to Gem and Book, we have this third type of lesson um, that the biggest goal here, and this is what Julie was mentioning earlier on, um, kind of in the PBL landscape, um, is really connecting things into that solution, into the real world application piece of this all. Um, want to just note, though, that this is a piece. Oh, there's a loud car driving. If you guys can hear that. Um, that um, this is a piece of our curriculum offering that doesn't necessarily need to be adopted by all. If you're an elementary school program, this might be a little bit too advanced for your students, but it's not necessarily true, especially if it's for a gifted program. Or also just we know certain learners, you know, have different needs and skill sets. So it's an additional um, thing that we can offer in a way that we can differentiate the program and help it to grow from that elementary to middle to high school level. For our middle and our high school learners, though, we know that there is an increased emphasis on bridging that gap and connecting the dots between what's being learned in certain programs and in certain platforms and connecting it to how it's going to actually inform in the real world. I mean, we talk about it like there's full CTE programs and department that's all career and technical um, experience, right? So what we want to do there is make sure that the lessons themselves are being uh, kind of reinforced in a way where the students are creating outputs that are going to set them up for long-term life success. So these external projects um, that, as you see here, that are done via an external IDE, IDE being an integrated development environment, basically just a fancy term for an external kind of web text editor. Um, but what students are gonna do, they're following a similar format where they'll have instructions. They're gonna have some of that handholding at the beginning, but it's gonna slowly go back, back, back. The training wheels are gonna come off. Um, and by the end of the program, they're gonna be creating their own original websites, games, media art expressions, all things that will get to stay and keep with them um, even after their time with Disney Code Illusion is passed. And so they will then get to use this for, um, you know, say it's a college portfolio piece, but also we're realizing even more and more college isn't the path for all students. It's not one size fits all even in that regard. So say they're wanting to enter the workforce right away. We know it's, you know, on demand economy. They can um, get jobs as freelancers doing things. They can use this to point to as proof of prior work experience and validation for skills. So it checks a lot of boxes. It helps with career readiness and preparedness. It helps with that motivation and engagement for students. It continues to differentiate the learning and the methodology. Um, and then finally, it also acts as another final layer of true competency-based understanding and mastery. If you're able to successfully create these outputs, um, then you're demonstrating to the team. As an educator, I know that this student has mastered these concepts and that no further remediation is needed, but they're actually kind of greenlit to continue moving forward. Um, so again, a lot there, um, but within that, they are broken down into our bite-sized magic quests and then our larger magic journeys. Um, so again, just the end goal though, to have your own original pieces of, um, I guess, kind of work and art in, in theory. Awesome. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on that before I hop into the platform? Awesome. You can see here, um, you know, we've got our, our coding window over here, preview window, um, and we are going to be very much set up in the same vein. Um, the difference between the two, you can break these because it's a real world environment. This is where um, our teachers have said students really gain confidence because, you know, they're doing it, right? They're producing it, which is so cool. In our platform, you know, it's controlled, they can't break it. So, you know, it's great for practice, but then they're bringing it and they're utilizing their skills, like Amanda said. So it's fantastic. Let me learn how to use my computer. All right, here we go. Now, if my internet will cooperate with me. Um, so like I said, it will be single sign-on for um, those who are integrated with Clever. 
um, class link as well as Google Classroom. So that will be all ready to go. Um, and I'm just gonna take you through the chapters really quick so you can see uh, what films are actually going to be included. Um, Cause I know this can be kind of misleading um, and more from like our childhood than our students. So we also have movies. Um, there's something for everyone here. And as I was saying, the green gems, again, are going to be game development. Red gems are going to be media art and blue will be web design. So chapter seven, the last chapter is going to be Elsa, of course, where you're looking at her little snow flurries that come out of her hands. I don't know why I do this whenever I say that, but I do. However, yeah, that'll be our greeting now, April. So now um, we also want every student to be engaged, right? Um, even the student who's like determined not to interact in your class, there's always that student. And the feedback we've gotten from teachers is that those students are really taking to this because they have found their niche, right? They have found something that has reached them that they feel confident in, which is awesome. Part of that could be the Disney factor, right? Part of it could be because they want to explore web design or they're really into gaming and they want to create their own games. The other aspect is anime. I worked at my daughter's book fair in the fall, which was a long time ago now, and anime posters were the first ones to sell out. I was shocked. I now have binders full of Pokemon cards that apparently I'm the one who organizes. I don't know what any of them are. I had some friends in their early 20s who came over and they were like, yeah, well, don't you have this, this, and this? I'm not collecting them. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, so there's a huge anime factor as well. Um, and where this kind of culminates in the whole program is um, where you're challenging a divine beast. And there's four divine beasts. And this is going to be very reminiscent of Street Fighter or Super Smash Brothers, where you've got the two life gauges and you're using all of your coding prowess to defeat the divine beast. Um, so it's kind of neat. You can see the different... Um, graphics with this, which are pretty cool as well. And then keep in mind, you've got Mimir guiding your way. But let me introduce you to Mimir. You also have some whimsical music playing as you go through this, which I know you probably can't hear, but I hear it as I'm going through it as well. So there's a lot happening right here. Um, so every time you go to a gem lesson, you are going to have expectations set, which is so important in a classroom environment. Um, no matter what, whether the student is doing this at home, if they're doing it waiting for sports to start or doing it in the classroom, expectations need to be set. So you have um, what focus area you're in, what the title is, output and objective. And then here's your competency rubric. See, it looks so like, oh my gosh, I got three stars on it. I can go to my little store and see what I can get as far as what have I unlocked? Yeah, right, that's your grade kid. So. Um, you also are going to see how long the lesson should last um, or is expected to last. And keep in mind, this range is geared towards a high school student. So I'm actually going to show you two different lessons that deal with circles. Uh, this is the very first like real lesson, if you will, that's not optional in the program. And here's our little friend, Mimir. And I'm going to kind of act as Mimir here because she's gonna start by giving us a tour. Um, and you'll notice she has a lot of words in here that are going to be pink. Those are like our key vocabulary words that you can take and extrapolate and start you know, putting them on the board and go reviewing with students. So she's gonna give you your little tour and then our output. So remembering the external ID that we just saw from Magic Quest and Magic Journeys, this is just flip flopped. You can also tell what, language you're going to be working with at the top of this colored bar, right where my cursor is down here. You have hints. Um, she's going to tell me to click on it and I'm, I will click on it. This will take away one of my stars though. And I learned that the hard way. This hurts my heart to do this guys. Yay. Yay. So what this does, though, is it doesn't just give you the full answer. I mean, at the, it, chapter one here, lesson one, yes, it gives you the full answer because 
realistically, we're not all Albert Einstein, right? However, as you go on, it's going to give you hints step by step. So it's going to try to prod you into um, it, remembering it. And if you don't, that's fine. Like, let's click it again and you'll get another hint for it. But it's step by step. It's not just like, oh, here's the answer. Go. All right. So now she's going to give us instructions. So we're drawing a circle and you can see what we're producing is going to be in pink, not only in her instruction bubble, but also up here. Um, and it shows us exactly where I need to put this so I can find where the 100s are down here. And now it's gonna turn gray because that's where I need to actually type. And this is going to be real time production. I got real excited when I did this for the first time It made my whole family come over and watch me. My daughter went into school telling everyone I was a coder. I can make a circle guys. That's, that's my coding ability. I I'm going to try to get to the point here where we get to an infographic because I want you to see that yes we're learning by doing here, but that doesn't mean that that's all we're doing and that's the only review that we're going to get. You can see Mamir is on the screen um, after we've produced the number, but and she's telling us like oh yeah notice that this is what you know changing that variable does, but they do a kind of wrap up which is included in your teacher resources. So if you have a student who is more of a visual learner and needs to have that in front of them, um, we also have note, note pages for students so that they can uh, write this stuff down for themselves, which I'm a big proponent of that. All right, 300. Here we go. It got bigger. Here we go. All right, so she's going to show us everything spelled out, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. And she'll talk it out to us again. Excellent job. Thank you. I am done with this lesson, guys. And look, I'm going to get two stars because I pushed the hint button. But it makes you feel really good. And then this is going to be your avatar for this, especially when you are doing the um, battle with the divine beast at the end. Uh, so we've learned how to do a circle, not only a circle, but also the size and moving it on the XY axis. When we then get to game development, which y'all could be like five weeks from when you do this lesson. Okay, think about that elementary school curriculum where you have 30 minutes a week, right? So it could be a while before I get to Goofy and there are circles again. Uh -oh. All right, well, let's see how we're doing here. So we're going to start with the basics and with that, relax. We're going to start with a review and with that, we're going to draw a circle. So the exact same prompt that we had in Mickey, but we're going to move a little faster this time. So this is where the scaffolding comes in. And I'm going to try to think real hard about it, Mimir, I promise. All right, let's start. So again, I've got the gray bar here. And look, it's all question marks here. So I need to be able to extrapolate which, second time I've used that, that should be my SAP word. Um, we're going to extrapolate where these variables need to go within the function. So we have ellipse, 200, 300, 100. Yay. I'm glad I remembered too, Mimir. Now, if I don't remember that though, and I need to show hint, the first hint that would have come up is just ellipse and the rest would have remained uh, question marks. So it's prompting you. So even if you just don't remember that, that's fine. And then I can go, ah, oh, I remember where the variables go. Any questions before I leave the platform? All right, cool. Ooh, no more music. Um, um, Julie, I have a question. Yes. April has another question. <laughs> So I really like it. Um, the only other thing I was thinking was what about for um, students with disabilities or some sort of um, possibly reading levels or reading dis disorders to support them because there's a lot of reading that Mimir has. So is there any way to like activate something to read to them or help them in that way? And Amanda, go. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that question. I'm glad that we didn't overlook that. Um, but 
uh, coming out actually the end of this month. Our product development team's been working super hard at this, um, but you will have the ability to have Mimir read the instructions aloud to you. So you can toggle something on so there can be narration. Also though, it has the ability to toggle on, toggle off. We know not all students are gonna need that or want that. Um, so you can have it read to you or you can have it not narrated to you. Um, not only will it be in English, but by the fall, it will also be the ability to have narration in Spanish. And so we can also, you know, reach those, um, our ESOL populations and make sure at least I say ESOL for um, Spanish for English being their second language and Spanish the predominant language. Um, and then we have in the roadmap to even add additional languages on top of that. So if we do have students that are coming from other backgrounds, we're making this as, um, you know, relevant and applicable for them. So Definitely have taken all of that into consideration. Um, it's also kind of in that way, another nod to cross-curricular application. Um, so helping with reading comprehension and competency. Um, so definitely ticking that box, even when you're going through, you know, coding or computer science, you're still reinforcing what you're learning um, kind of in the reading and language acquisition side of things. Um, even on the math front, you know, they're doing things with variables. And as you saw Julie manipulating numbers for um, positioning, there's even some stuff with um, like parabolas when Aladdin's flying on his magic carpet, which I'm sure to some students, you know, elementary level, you're like, what the heck is a parabola? But as you start to get middle school, high school geometry, it all starts connecting the dots. So it's a cool way that the program is connecting a lot of those kind of disparate, I would say, kind of uh, subjects. So I'm excited that we're able to bridge that gap. The other thing I want to add on top of that, because Amanda um, brought up a good point, the reason we are making these updates to the program is because our teachers want it. So we listen to what they say. I know this is a foreign concept for many of us who taught. Um, they, we listen and we take your feedback seriously and then we take it to product development and they do it because they see a need and they want to make the best product for y'all and we want to make your lives easy as possible. Right. This should not be something that is difficult or like, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe I have to, you know, help out with this class. This should be a, oh, yeah, not a problem. I got this. Right. And part of that is our customer success team who is there to support you all the time. So we're not only supporting in resources, so you could just let the kids go. If you want, if you want to throw vocabulary terms up there, we have that in our lesson overviews. We've got those infographics. We've got the prerequisites. We've got the lesson planning guide for every chapter. And it's all, all 125 lessons have this completely spelled out for you. It will be attached to your admin account as well as the standard alignment. So that's all in one place for you to try to make it as easy as possible. Um, but again, we've got our teacher dashboards that you can, you can make sure that the students are on track. Our customer success team is doing that as well too, right? Because we'll check in. I say we, it's not me, but they will check in monthly um, and they, you'll get to know them real well. You guys will be friends where, um, you know, I'm having a problem with this account, help. They'll do it, right? So you have that relationship and that support um, that as long as you let them know, you're good to go. Um, and it could be via email, it could be um, on Zoom, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, when you start utilizing the program and we're getting the credentials ready for your students, um, the customer success team will actually onboard you and any facilitators. Um, if it's for a district, then we could do it as groups in different uh, grade levels, or we can even provide professional development on professional learning days. Um, so best practices or um, equity in computer science and coding. We could provide that type of um, content. That's what I was looking for. We could provide that kind of content to you. Sorry, it's I'm on East Coast time right now. Um, so with that in mind, um, the metrics that we provide for you are all going to be on your teacher dashboard. You can see the stars are present here. So there's your competency rubric. Um, if there's a quiz for that, it'll show you how many questions the students did correctly, um, how many hints were used. If they used any hints, it turns red. Um, and how long it took for the student to complete the lesson. There's other, um, there's going to be other information that's on there as well, like um, their last login um, and how long they spent on it, just so that you have, we have some teachers who want to have that minute detail. We have other teachers who are like, cool, you're getting exposed to computer science curriculum. 
I'm, that's awesome. Great, move on. All right. So if you want to um, try this out um, with your students, you can get in touch with me and here's my email. Um, you can get in touch with Amanda or Stella's on here as well. Um, and it's just our first name at lifeistechusa.com. Um, and we're happy to talk to you about what you're doing now and how we can get to your ideal with that. Um, we can also talk you through at the district level how to plan a complete pathway, right? It may take you a few years, but we will show you exactly how you, how you get there. I'll have it all laid out for you. I can do the pricing and the quote for you. You don't have to lift a finger for it. I promise I will take care of all of it for you. Um, but also if you would like to uh, drop your email in the chat, I can send you the link to our hour of code. Um, also April can know that you're here, um, but I can send you a link to our hour of code lesson, which is a 30 minute lesson um, for media art within our platform. Um, so you will have the ability to try that out give it to students, let them try it out as well. Now would be, a, I'm gonna get rid of the screen for a second so we can see each other. Um, does anyone have any questions? April? Joanne, I see, I see that you popped, popped um, your pick, your, you know, now we have a visual of you. Do you have a question for Mr. Lee? Um, no, this is actually my uh, second day <laughs> life's tech. So I am uh, kind of fly on the wall today and just. Uh, oh, I just now noticed your background. I'm sorry. <laughs> that That's bad. okay. Well, so you're here just learning on uh, from um, Julie. Nice. Yes, I well, am. I'm glad that you're here. Glad to hear. Jackie. Thank you for coming. I didn't see that you were in here. Jackie is also with Region 9. Um, she works for the events team. Um, there's, there's events all throughout the state of New Mexico. And I'm so glad that you made it and let us know if you have any question, questions. Hi, April. Thanks. It's Thanks. awesome. <laughs> I love Disney. <laughs> I know. I know. Everybody does, right? And Ms. Sierra Varga, do you have any questions for Ms. Julie today? Uh, hi, no, I don't. Thank you so much for this presentation. I actually work for one of the tribes in New Mexico, Pickeries. So this is a program that I'm interested in seeing and how we can help our kids with coding. That would be Heck awesome. Yeah. yeah. Heck yeah. Wow. I'm just, yeah. Let, let us know. Um, did you get their email information? Did you yes, copy did. that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then what I may also do is make sure that I specifically share your information with them, your email that I got from your registration, if that's okay. Yes, that is fine with me. Awesome. Okay. And that way they can follow up with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Right. Man, I didn't even look at the clock and look at that. I know, 4.31. And I have got to jump off and I wish I didn't have to. I can leave the meeting totally open and you guys can close her down. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Oh.